one, I'm Suman. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Marco. Marco helps uh, companies connect their people through experiences in a time um, where it's kind of more challenging than ever. And we have here Chris Shembra. I was just joking. I'm not really sure how to introduce you. You, you do a lot of things, but you are a gratitude expert. How would you how'd you uh, introduce yourself, I guess? And Suman, I'm, I'm a guy that likes playing bocce ball down on the river in <laughs> Domino Park. I, I really, really, really enjoy the partnership that we and you have at Marco. You know, we have a burning desire on our heart to help people connect in the most meaningful ways humanly possible. And so the partnership that we have going into companies together and helping solve a, a big crisis of disconnection and the epidemic of loneliness within their cultures, uh, it, it, it's a great, great joy to be here with you all today. Amazing. And so I would say Chris and I met, I mean, gosh, it's must have been over a year now. Yeah. Um, and so Chris, we'll get into it, but he's written kind of a couple of books, in, including Gratitude and Pasta, Gratitude Through Hard Times. I remember when we met, you brought me a, a can of pasta, a, a <laughs> bottle of pasta, and a, and a book, and it had this beautiful inscription in it, and it was super nice. It was a Sunday, I remember. It was at a restaurant, um, Upland, right next to it, where yeah. I live in, in New York, where, where you also live. Um, but just rewinding, perhaps, uh, I guess this, in terms of your background, you can weave in why he gave me that pasta sauce, because I was kind of <laughs> like, what the heck is going on here? But yeah, big, big thanks to Court Roberts for making the introduction. I remember the first yes, time we met to Court. <laughs> the first time we met at, at brunch. I think we shared a, a, a pile of donuts and some wonderful food at Upland. It was yes. some of the best donuts I've had in the city. But, you know, my my story or the part of my story that's relevant for today's conversation really dates back to July of 2015. This is a quick four minute story to give a flavor of why we're so obsessed with helping people create meaningful moments of human connection. If you looked at my life in July of 2015, it wouldn't have looked too dissimilar from the guy you see sitting on this oversized couch in New York City. I, like many of you listening to this podcast, I had a job. I had a roof over my head. I had good friends. I had people that said nice things about me. I was doing well in my life and in my career. According to how life was supposed to look on paper, life looked good. But one day I woke up and realized that just because a life looks good on paper doesn't mean it feels good in the heart. There's oftentimes a disconnect, and we all feel it so often. See, I realized that disconnect when I had just come back to New York City after producing a, a Broadway play over in Rome, Italy. It was a one-man play play about Fiorello LaGuardia, former mayor of New York City. Um, Rome made me come alive in ways I'd never felt. They walk different. They talk different. They love different. They honor history different. Everything's different. It's La Dolce Vita, the good life. And when I got back home to New York City, I realized lonely, unfulfilled, disconnected, insecure, this ain't it. And I have a lot of different chapters in my life that when I feel those kind of negative emotions all at once, I usually do bad things. I have a long history of non-suicidal self-injury, depression, jail, multiple stints of rehab. I didn't want to go back. And in that moment, I thought, what can I bring and do in New York City to remind me of what it felt like to live a full life in Rome, Italy? Well, what'd you do? (laughs) I looked at pasta sauce. (laughs) And I said, I got to bring this home to New York City. So in my kitchen, in my 350 square foot studio apartment at the time, I invented a pasta sauce recipe. And I thought it was a pretty good pasta sauce, but I figured I should feed it to people to really see if it was good or not. And assuming that's when it all began, July 15th, 2015, I hosted a dinner party. 6.30 p.m. cocktails began. 8 p.m. dinner was served, but at 7.47 p.m., we put the pasta in the pot and we delegated all these specific tasks to get the people to work together to create the meal. So we had this shared group experience. It lowered the ego. We had a sense of connection. And halfway through the dinner, I paused the conversation and asked a very specific question. I'll get to that question a little bit later in our conversation, but when I asked it to this group of 15 of my friends that didn't know each other, 
they told the most magical stories I'd ever seen in human existence. And a few of them cried. They felt so connected. They felt so vulnerable. They felt so safe. And I loved the feeling of helping people connect. And I said, by golly, I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. So we kept doing those dinner parties every week, once a week for free in our home. By the end of that first year, we'd hosted 54 dinners in 52 weeks, feeding 808 people for free in our home. And after that, all of a sudden the phone started ringing and great CEOs started calling us up saying, I had a good time at your dinner. I see what you do helping people create safe spaces to gather. Why don't you come help us do that for our teams to help us connect with our clients, our executive board, whatever it may be. And that launched the next great chapter of my life. Well, it's interesting. We So we met a while ago. Um, Chris is a host on our platform. He's also um, helped facilitate some incredible experiences for our community that we're building. So we work with a lot of people leaders and we do these events called Community Catalyst Events. Mm. Um, flew to San Francisco and did one with us. And then Mark Levy, who's advisor now at Marco, and he, he um, joined at the tail end of an experience you facilitated for people leaders here in New York. And what's cool about, kind of unique about you is that a lot of what you do is very relevant in the workplace. And you you have a lot of stats and data, and we'll get to that stuff. But your experience isn't just citing a bunch of McKinsey studies. It's extremely human, and it's extremely authentic. And you create a space where people can kind of react, be themselves, kind of build trust, which is ultimately what folks need to do, I think, in life and in the workplace. Mm -hmm. So that's just uh, uh, kind of something to reflect on. Um, but... So you started this kind of community and like all communities, it started small and then now it's kind of grown into this movement, which folks can relate to because I think everyone at some point over the past few years, especially has felt disconnected, I imagine. <sighs> oh my golly. I mean, you know, you talk about statistics, the Surgeon General of the United States, Vivek H. Murthy, before we even had COVID-19, published a study that showed that 51% of the American workforce reports being lonely yeah. on a consistent basis. That's half of you that are listening to this podcast. Loneliness is equivalent to the reduction of lifespan of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Wow. Seven years off your life. So it, it's a great, great, great epidemic we're facing in our world. We have so many different epidemics in our world. We have an opioid crisis. We're fighting foreign wars. We have class divide. We have social warfare. We have all these kind of things. The thing that keeps me up all night is just helping that many more people feel a little bit less lonely and more humanly connected in the world that we live in today. Yeah. I'm super passionate about community. I think community is something that having Indian immigrant parents who came to North Carolina, they've, they've tried to find, they, they have found their community it's it's has so many meanings and we'll get to kind of how how did your parents balance the idea of preserving their authentic heritage yeah while also you know meeting new people and learning their new traditions and you know finding a common ground there how did they do that so well it's a good question so i laugh cuz my my dad uh, moved here from Sri Lanka. There was a civil war in Sri Lanka. So his house and business got burned down. He, tr I mean, he pursued the American dream, right? So he, he was then in India and he uh, moved to the States. His first job was at a Czechoslovakian chicken farm. He went to IIT <laughs> okay. in India, by the way. It's like a great engineering school. And I always laugh because I was like, why the heck did you move to North Carolina? It's like not necessarily... <laughs> The most diverse, I mean, and he said he knew one guy named Lalji and he happened to move. He, there wasn't Google back in the day, right? So he goes, I moved there and we, it is, it is what it is. He, he, they were trying to build a better life for, for their kids, us. And I would say to, to answer your question, it's interesting because I don't necessarily think they perhaps did the best job immediately at, at figuring out how to be a part of quote unquote American culture, but that is what American culture is. It's a mosaic of all these different cultures mm. actually. And I would say, um, I mean, they did a great job raising us, right? Like they put us, we never, we didn't grow up super rich, but we, we never felt poor in the sense that we were always in piano class, uh, you know, swimming lessons, soccer class. We also studied the tablo, which is Indian drum. We, we did Indian dance. There, there was a lot of stuff that they did um, for us to really raise us 
still they also sent me to India every summer, which sucked because it's like hot as hell. And, <laughs> and I'm like sitting there. And so, I mean, I think now I, I don't do a great job reinvesting in kind of finding my cultural identity. But on the subject of community, my mom is very religious. She goes to the temple because she tries to find, I think about that because I'm not super religious and she's always saying like, hey, you should go to the temple. That's because she found her community there, mm-hmm. right? And so that's great. And she has, she's, you know, she uh, has been in the States for, you know, 30 plus years and she's got, a great group of friends here, but that's the beautiful thing of, about America, right? Like she kind of found her place and, and here I am, I've lived in 13 cities for over three months and all over the States and all thanks to them. So thanks for the question. <laughs> I don't know if I answered it, but <laughs> it, it was a perfect answer. What you've taught us and the listeners is that, uh, through their darkest hour, the Sri Lankan civil war, they came to America relying on the importance of human connection with that one person. Yeah. Not yeah. human connection with a billion people. They invested in a strong relationship with one person and moved close to them to build a community. What you also taught us is uh, one of my favorite lines from our second book, Gratitude Through Hard Times. One of my favorite lines is the definition of belonging. We learned it from our friend Lori Cornmesser, and it says that belonging is not blending belonging is bonding. Mm. Your parents didn't have to change who they were to show up as they authentically are and respect the traditions of where they were moving and bring in their own traditions themselves. They didn't have to change who they were. They showed up and bonded in a meaningful way with others over time. And that's something that any community or company that's listening to this podcast, if you're seeking to use belonging as one of your cures to this loneliness epidemic. It's not about changing the people that work for you. It's about helping them bond together and show up as they authentically are. And I'll say one more thing. I think that's really well put. I used to, growing up in North Carolina, going to school at Vanderbilt, it's pretty, these are pretty, living in Texas, I kind of pushed away parts of my Indian identity that now I'm like, wow, that's super cool. And by the way, most people actually think it's cool too. Now, I think the there's some uh, times have changed in some ways, people are much more accepting, right? So they're kind of like, oh my yeah. gosh, you play the Indian drum? Like, tell me more about people that. People are just excited to see you lit up about something that you're so passionate about, which is your your ancestral roots and culture and food and traditions. And when you get to teach people other... I mean, you know, it sounds like you like to surround yourself with people who like to learn about new things. Yeah. And when you bring an authentic part of your heart and soul that you get to teach others, that's a form of connection. I love That's that. what community's built on. I love that. So, two big, t- a few big stops. We can talk for a while. But you mentioned <laughs> gratitude through hard times, which I've read. It's a fantastic book, uh, and I've read the gratitude and pasta book. What, what is what is grat? You know, why why are you passionate about gratitude? Yeah. What is gratitude? Let's start with that. I mean, you know, gratitude at its most simplest definition to us is the the art of acknowledging uh, value or benefits that you've received from others. So this could be mm. big or small. This could be, um, you know, someone's held the door open for you when your hands were full. That is something of great value to you. You're able to feel moments of gratitude because of that benefit that you've received. Maybe someone bought you a, uh, a violin when you were 13 uh, that didn't even know you. Um, and now you're a violin virtuoso. That was a great benefit or something of great value that someone bestowed upon you in your past. Gratitude can also go the other way. Maybe someone broke up with you. Maybe someone cheated on you and y'all broke up and it inspired you to do four things differently in your life and go down a new path that you never knew existed And the positive benefits that came as a result of that breakup and torrential love affair are greater than the negative things that that person did to you. You can find tremendous positive benefits and tremendous value. You can find tremendous gratitude in the shitty things those people did to you. So gratitude's all over the map. Something of vast importance that I think is that Gratitude isn't just a self-reflective practice. It's not just something that you do in your bedside table. You got a journal that you write down three things you're grateful for at the beginning and end of every day. Yeah, okay, that's gratitude. 
That's not the gratitude we practice. There's a great researcher named Barbara Fredrickson who states, to be grateful is to be grateful to someone. We believe in the pro-social power of gratitude, that when you are looking for benefits or you're looking for moments of value that you've received in your life, don't find it in events or the weather or the sky or, you know, the food. Find benefits and value in the people that surround you. I'm not grateful for this apple. I'm grateful for the farmer who picked this mm. apple and put it on the truck to drive for the farmer's market that I could go to on my Saturday morning and find moments of joy. Um, so gratitude um, is good to give. It's good to receive. And it's good to observe others practicing when it's done in a pro-social way amongst community, which is so important for leaders listening to this, that when you're going out and building an organization and you're going out and building a community, don't just teach people self-reflective practices of gratitude that they put in their bedside table. Teach them the principles and the skills they need to give gratitude to each other, for you as a leader to give more gratitude to them, or for them to give gratitude to you as the leader. It goes up, down, left, and right within an organization in a pro-social way. Yeah. So what if I were to say, why do I need to give a shit about this? I'm running a company. It's an enterprise. We're trying to be productive. We're trying to make yeah. money. Why do I need to waste my time with telling people about gratitude? You know, for visionary leaders, which I know a lot By the way, of... I don't actually believe that. I'm just... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for, for visionary leaders, which is so many of you in this call... For visionary leaders, gratitude is not just a sentiment. It's a strategy for economic expansion. Yeah. And after the podcast, you can, uh, you can read more case studies about how gratitude helped Howard Schultz, you know, build Starbucks, uh, how gratitude helped blah, 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 build that thing, how blah, blah. We've got all those case studies. At the end of the day, 81% of workers report being more willing to work harder when their efforts are met and appreciated with gratitude. Yep. Gratitude practice in a peer-to-peer co-worker level before a stressful activity lowers cardiovascular stress by 54%. For instance, imagine if you are in manufacturing. I'll tell an example of one client of mine. I went over to the Czech Republic. You mentioned Czechoslovakia. Uh, obviously, uh, Czechoslovakia was during the USSR. Uh, after the fall of the USSR, it became the Czech Republic. So I went to the Czech Republic a few months ago, and I went to go uh, give a keynote to the 120 senior leaders of a big uh, brewery called the Asahi Group. Huge company with tons of brands. We met at one of the breweries of one of their brands called Pilsner Uroquel. It's the original Pilsner. It's in a town called Pilsen. And I'm walking around the brewery on a tour before my keynote. And I get up to a window. And I look through the window and I see down into the bottling facility, the, the, uh, the, the manufacturing engine of this great company. And I see one guy with a red glove on holding a yellow hammer or something of percussion. And his arm keeps going in and out of this machine. Is he hammering something? Is he placing something? I don't know. But he's doing that for a few minutes on end. Ten feet away from him is a co-worker, a woman, who's sweeping, mopping, keeping the place clean. Why is her job so important? Because if she doesn't do her job in the optimal capacity and the floor becomes dirty or slippery, he's likely to slip and fall and get his hand chopped off in that machine or blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And so I asked the client, what moments during their shifts or during their exchange of shifts do you create for gratitude? And what we ended up creating with them is that during the change of shifts, you can have coworkers who are doing very stressful activities on the manufacturing floor together, giving each other authentic moments of gratitude. <clears throat> 
pre or post shift, that helps lower cardiovascular stress. That makes people's efforts feel appreciated and recognized, making them more willing to work harder. And it makes them, it gives them a genuine sense of belonging, which is important for retention and loyalty. And it's even, you know, important to help attract, you know, the right talent. And so, you know, there's tons of examples like that of how gratitude can be part. Um, you know, maybe you're a leader who's listening on this call. You can take time once a week to have a 30 minute call with a direct report and give them an authentic moment of gratitude. Gallup found that when a leader checks in with a direct report once a week, it takes engagement levels from about 20% up to 80%. Wow. Gallup and Dr. Jim Harder, the chief scientist of workplace well being at Gallup, talked about this on our podcast and talked about this in his newest book with, uh, with, uh, with, with Jim Clifton. How, how do you think about how it's become more difficult, obviously, with remote work? I mean, you just mentioned you could do a call. If I'm working next to you, I'm saying, hey, Chris, you did a damn good job writing this book, right? Right there, it's easy. How do you think about creating that space and time when you actually are back-to-back -back Zoom meeting, you don't see each other, mm -hmm. you know, this new way of working? Yeah, I, you know, I think, um, I think that's a great question. When do you create the time? It's very simple. People don't pl plan to fail. They fail to plan. If recognition, appreciation, gratitude, workplace connection is one of the foundational strategies of your culture, you have to make the time for it. Maybe there's one less team meeting per week that your team, I mean, let's be- Which, which people would probably be excited yeah, about. Yeah, <laughs> let's be honest. Like, how well do team meetings actually work? That's for another conversation. That is Yes. But if you're intentional about human connection, you have to be intentional about putting it on the calendar, even if it's five minutes per employee, once per week, a moment of authentic recognition and appreciation. What's not talked about enough is... Can I, can I just say, say yeah. something to that? So uh, we have five, five of our employees are in the Philippines, and Yana, who works with me, her title is EA, but she does all kinds of stuff, and yeah. I, my life wouldn't would completely fail without her but she starts every meeting off with a uh, a share where she'll show photos of her kid i think i've talked about this before but in the moment i used to honestly and then i'll be late in sending the photos and i used to be like oh gosh and now it's one of the most distinct memories yeah. of <laughs> and it humanizes each party because then it's like hey this is my kid and i'm like oh i'm here with my family and it's worth it actually in the it it's not for every company this is not a universal strategy or a moment of advice, but if you are the type of leader that hired people under the belief that you belong, you're appreciated, you're recognized, your work is validated, you have to work hard. I'm not saying yeah. that, but if it's part of your cultural promise of how you attracted the top talent, then you need to set the intention of creating time to recognize and appreciate your people. It's in the job yeah. description. They yeah. expect it. Right? I actually think it is for, I mean, there's elements, I worked in finance for a while, yeah. even if you're working at, you might deliver it in a different tone or different way, but my belief is that everyone likes this kind of stuff. And not only everyone likes it, it also of makes course. it more fun to, it, and I don't do a great job necessarily of it all the time, but it is it's, um, something that people should work on. Look, it's, it's um, you know, it's it's something that scientifically is 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 good for us, right? We, we are walking around this world, uh, processing nine bits of negative information for every one bit of positive information. It's how we're wired. It's, it's the amygdala filter. We are wired to say, thousands of years ago, to say, I need to remember every negative bit of information so that I don't get eaten by a lion, I don't eat the wrong bush, I don't <laughs> die from whatever. That's all you thought about thousands of years ago. There's a little bit less threat of death now we need to change the way we're wired. We need to process more bits of positive information than negative information. Gratitude has the ability to broaden and build the brain's thought action repertoire needed for that positive affect and for those positive action changes. And so the more we practice it, the more that positive mental attitude becomes part of our DNA, that's where creativity and innovation truly grow and flourish. People don't produce the best results or want to work for a company when it's a fear-based, anxiety-based, 
nervousness-based leadership style. They perform the best when the leader inspires the best performance out of their people. An inspired employee is 225% more highly engaged. A highly engaged employee leads to an increased average, 20% in productivity, 21% in sales. Why not? Let's yeah, do it. Sounds like, <laughs> Come on. Uh, yeah, well, it sounds like my, my bold boss always said, you can do good while doing good. So it sounds like mm -hmm. you're just going to be happier if you, if you do this kind of stuff. Look, people are freaking struggling. Yeah. I mean, right? We got a crisis of disconnection, an epidemic of loneliness. 76% of Americans report at least one symptom of a mental health condition on a daily basis. Those are your people. That's what you're up against. Yep. You have the choice whether to turn a blind eye to it or be the one person in their life that helps solve that glaring issue. You're asking people to work 10 hours a day for you you're asking people to work six days a week, even on the weekends, for your mission, your purpose, whatever you're trying to build or sell. You're asking this from people, then you owe it to them to be there for them and help solve this pressing challenge, loneliness and disconnection. Because if they spend the majority of their life with you, right, you spend more hours at work than you do at home or with your spouse or sleeping, then you need to provide that safe harbor for them. I mean, let's quote, let's, let's quote rising tides for a sec. Yes. Let me give you an inspirational story. On Thursday, July 19th, 2016, I was hosting a dinner party. I was hosting a 160 person dinner party to celebrate the year anniversary of us hosting a dinner party every week, once a week for free in our home. 54 dinners in 52 weeks feeding 808 people for free in our 350 square foot studio apartment so i wanted to celebrate by throwing a 160 person dinner party that morning i was talking to my friend todd and blah 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 blah. todd said yeah chris a rising tide lifts all boats like, my god todd that's genius he's like i didn't invent it but you can use it by that night that quote was on our dinner party program the night went off with the greatest success. Everybody's hugging and kissing and gratituding and blah, blah, blah. -ing. And I hang that dinner party program on my wall as the token that I can, I can do something and I can grow this thing and our movement's just beginning. And I stare at that dinner party program every day for the last seven years. Well, two weeks ago, I'm looking at that dinner party program and I'm looking at that quote, a rising tide lifts all boats. And I say, holy smokies, I've had it all wrong. I call up Todd and I say- So you're still friends with Todd. I'm still friends with Todd. He's moved out to New Jersey. He's got great kids. He's got a great Very wife. Good. He's doing his thing. I haven't spoken too in-depthly with him in, in the last couple of years, but he picked up on the first ring and I said, Todd- it's not about the boats. It's not about the boats. Like, you all right, man? What's going on? I said, Todd, do you remember what you told me on the morning of Thursday, July 19, 2016? He's like, no, man. I'm like, a rising tide lifts all boats. I've been thinking it's about the boats this whole time. But here's the truth that you leaders need to know. Great leaders build great harbors. The true economic potential of any successful team or organization lies not in the strength of the individuals, but in their ability to connect, collaborate, and champion a shared vision. Having strong boats in your harbor is not enough if you don't build the infrastructure to help them connect, collaborate, and stay together in meaningful ways. And so, I started thinking about that metaphor as like a marina, a harbor. The strength of an organization is dependent upon how leaders can create the dock systems that the boats tie up against and the docks rise and fall with the tides to overcome economic downturns and uncertainty. Every great marina or harbor has a retaining wall like the ancient port of Jaffa to break the big waves from the Mediterranean to protect the harbor. This is your role as a leader, is to take care of the boats better than you 
could ever dream of. You are custodians of the majority of these people's waking hours. Show up and lead with that intention and solve the biggest crisis we're going through right now, the crisis of disconnection and an epidemic of loneliness within the workplace. Great leaders build harbors of meaningful moments of human connection. I love it. I actually, I follow in social media, so I, I, I think I saw this written down on like a piece of paper and I was intending on asking you about it. So, that, <laughs> so I, I appreciate you sharing. What, th this is from your book, I'll steal it, but you stole it from someone else, but you, you, you just to bring everything together, you said, you talked about companies, the word companies, come, ponies. I don't, oh, you're come here. Ponies. So, so why are communities, yeah. relevant? what's the difference, you know, what's the similarity between a company and a community? Yeah. They're one of the same, it's, according to you. Yeah, I mean, I didn't steal it from nobody. I stole it from the Latin language. <laughs> so true. if you look up the Latin origination of the word company, in Latin, it's companis. Com means together, panis means bread. The original companies were built to be communities. The original companies were built of individuals that got together and broke bread. Right? True potential is, is not about the, the, you know, the, the individual success within the organization. It's whether or not you can get them unified and connect together. And when you help people break bread together in a metaphorical way, uh, you, can really, you can really survive just about everything. Because yeah. a, 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 a good team grows only closer through hard times. Um, but hard times can also break apart bad teams. It's interesting to think about what you just said about the harbor and just the, this notion of waves around hard times are going to come. Yeah. Right? You, you mentioned economic downturns and upturns. And, and I guess the point you make is if you have the right community, then you could figure out how to, by the way, hard, hard times, waves, we'll you through the, hard times. the, the tide. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> the, the tides, right? High tide, low tide happens four times a day, right? You got two high tides and two low tides per day. You're going to have moments every single day in your team that are really, really freaking awesome. Woohoo! we just did that thing. We're really, really, really low. Oh no. How can we find a way out? By the way, as a founder, this is true. This yeah. happens eight yeah, times a day. This is happening like eight <laughs> times a day. And so how you weather those tidal fluctu fluctuations and economic moments of prosperity or downturn relies on the strength of your connections. Through challenging times, the greatest leaders don't just strategize or optimize, they humanize, exemplifying Wait, the can you power. Say that? That's powerful. Can you say that one more time? Through the hardest of times, through moments of adversity, the greatest leaders don't just strategize or optimize, they humanize, they humanize, exemplifying the power of community and connection, right? Great leaders recognize that it's not just putting the best people on your team. It's helping your team connect in the most meaningful ways. It's not about the idea generation. It's about the strength, right? Like great leaders understand how to create communities that value the present and listen more than they speak. It's not based on what kind of ideas you as the individual contributor can lend. It's about listening and creating the spaces to the ideas that everybody has, right? Belonging is not about idea generation. Belonging is about having your idea authentically heard. They might not use it, but at least they're listening. Any community leader can do that. So on that note, a lot of great, a lot of great lessons here. You told this story that stuck with me the last time we had our community catalyst event, which is kind of on this topic around um, Doc Rivers being a leader, this notion of, I mean, in sports, there's amazing athletes, there's individuals oh. who are incredible. And then there's how do you unite kind mm -hmm. of a team in this context as a leader? Perhaps do you want to yeah. share that? Oh, God. I'm, you know, I'm glad you asked. It, it's a, it is a fantastic story. And um, so um, I, I first heard this story philosophy um, back in 2017, but I didn't develop it in, into a, a story that I, I now give in every single keynote today. It, it's the story of uh, April 18th, 2007. On April 18th, 2007, 19,580 people are packed in TD Garden chanting, fire, doc, 
fire doc. It's uh, the Boston Celtics, a once storied franchise, have just had a, ba- a run of bad luck finishing the season with uh, one of the worst records in the NBA, 24 and 58. And all these people are chanting, fire Doc, fire Doc. They're talking about their head coach, Doc Rivers. Now, as a side question, how many people that are listening to this podcast have ever had thousands of people in one room chanting for your untimely departure from the workplace? God, that's got to stink. Yes, that would be unfortunate. Well, to turn the tide that offseason, they don't fire Doc Rivers. Instead, the Boston Celtics make a series of key trades, bringing in Kevin Garnett and Ray Allen to join the superstar Paul Pierce in Boston. Now, even that decision was fraught with uncertainty because all of the individual superstars have prior interpersonal conflict. So Doc Rivers knew he had a monumental task ahead of himself, one that went beyond managing minutes and drawing up plays. He needed to find a way to bring individual superstars into a unified team. And he got creative at the offseason, preseason training camp in Rome, Italy, the place that has my entire heart and soul, he introduces the philosophy of Ubuntu. Now, Ubuntu is a South African proverb that loosely translates to I am because we are or humanity towards others. It really embodies the idea of connection and community and mutual caring of others. Desmond Tutu says that Ubuntu is the essence of being human He and Nelson Mandela actually use it as the rallying cry to unite South Africa in a post-apartheid world. And to Doc, the phrase simply means, I can't be all I can be unless you are all you can be. I can never be threatened because of how good you are because the better off you are, the better off I will be. And he decided to break up that philosophy into smaller parts and get the rookies on his team to sell it to the rest of the team. So at training camp, the rookies gave this great presentation. A um, little humor, a lot of passion, a little bit of swag. It worked great. By the end of the presentation, Kevin Garnett, the superstar, raises his hand in the back of the room and says, Ubuntu on three, we're in. So that season starts rolling along. They start playing team first, unselfish, Ubuntu-flavored basketball. And all of a sudden, personal tragedy strikes. Doc Rivers' father passes away. You know, he gets the call at 10 a.m. By noon, Doc Rivers is on the plane going back to Chicago to attend the funeral with his family. And in his absence, they have a game that night. At halftime, Kevin Garnett, his superstar, calls up Doc Rivers. Hey, coach, when you're sad, I'm sad. The game comes down to the final 7.17 seconds. Paul Pierce inbounds the ball to Ray Allen. Ray Allen sinks a three at the corner, right at the buzzer, and the Celtics win the game. Doc comes back. I mean, the team that night is just chanting at half court with all the interviews, Ubuntu, Doc Rivers, Unity, I am because we are, etc. And when Doc Rivers comes back, they're more unified, having overcome a moment of adversity, and they freaking steamroll the league, playing team first Ubuntu basketball. The Celtics that year would finish the season 66 and 16, far cry from 24 and 58. In the pinnacle of their journey on June 17, 2008, they drown out their long term rivals, the Los Angeles Lakers, and become NBA champions for the first time in a couple decades. And that story. I am because we are putting we over me. Ubuntu is the story of not just individual superstars playing selfish basketball, but it's a coach getting them to unite, collect, uh, connect, uh, collaborate, and champion a shared vision. He chose the rookie team players to spread the message. The individual superstars bought in. They persevered through moments of personal tragedy. They succeeded in the absence of their leader, and they won. 
And so many of you are listening to this podcast wondering, how does that affect the organization that I lead? Well, look into your organization in the last five years and look, what moments have you given rookies the time to shine, the ability to spread and own culture? What have you done to turn individual superstars that might be competing each o- against each other into unified contributors, championing a shared vision? How do your people unify around your mission, vision, values, the things that are planted on your wall, but actually need to be in their heart to lead them through moments of adversity? And so you can look no further than the 2008 Boston Celtics and the principles of Ubuntu for that type of community spirit that we're all promoting here at 747 and at Marco. It's an incredible story. <clears throat> what I love is, I'll close this off with, we were in a room, you know, 30, 40, really impressive people leaders, um, successful professionally. And I mean, first of all, everyone, I mean, Chris is an amazing facilitator for anything you want to do with your company, but it's not just the stories and, and having those shared. It's actually that you then created these vessels where people could talk with one another, share how that story, how they thought about that in their own life, which is really the most powerful p- part of all of that, where you can hear something and be like, gosh, that's kind of, kind of amazing. It, and, then they, and then you go, you if, know. Have, if I can do my job the way that I'm put on this earth to do, it's that I can look at stories or ideas or set declarative statements around anything in this world, and that I can figure out the right questions to facilitate amongst your team to help y'all connect around those ideas. If the idea or declarative statement is that every great leader should wear the color blue, I will facilitate meaningful moments of human connection using questions that I have to get y'all to talk about the color blue, (laughs) right? And so I'm so grateful that I was able to find this strength. I'm so grateful that I'm able to partner with organizations like Marco to bring this message of facilitation out to great leaders like you. So I thank you for having me on the podcast that, today. Ubuntu. I guess that'll be the name of the podcast. So I feel like it has to be. Uh, well, cheers. Thanks, pal. Amazing. Glad to be here.